For our final conversation, here to explore the weaponization of loneliness, please welcome former Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton. Joined by The Atlantic's editor-in-chief and moderator of Washington Week with The Atlantic, Jeffrey Goldberg. Like I told you, it's not the hardest crowd. I've always wanted to be on the arena stage, Jeff. Not, <laughs> not the toughest crowd you might face uh, today, but you know, we'll, we'll try to keep it lively. Uh, thank you very much for being here, and, and, and you're a repeat um, visitor to the Atlantic Festival, so we appreciate that. If you do like six more times, you get a free latte. Hey. You, get, you, get the, you get a punch card. Sign we gotta, me up. We got to get you the punch card. Um, but I, I want to, we want to talk about some, some very serious things. And I want to start with a very serious and sad thing, uh, the news this morning that your friend and colleague, right. uh, uh, Senator Feinstein, has passed. Um, you were very, um, uh, very close with her. And, and I was, uh, I'm sure everybody would be interested in, in hearing a little of your recollection of, of working with her and being friends with her. Well, I... Um was, yes, a friend, but also a great admirer of Dianne Feinstein. She was an extraordinary public servant and uh, political leader, uh, first in California, well, first in San Francisco, then California, and obviously uh, in our country. And I, I just, I saw her as somebody who was a true trailblazer uh, because of her uh, devotion to finding solutions to problems. You know, this sounds like old-fashioned uh, politics, which I still adhere to. She was always looking for where that common ground could be uh, found and inhabited. And she was absolutely fearless, um, but also, you know, very open. And, you know, she was the primary sponsor of the assault weapons ban back in 94. Um, uh, in large measure because of the traumatic experience she had discovering her colleague on the San Francisco City Council, Harvey Milk, murdered. And I will never forget the speech she gave uh, in favor of the assault weapons ban when she talked about what it is like to see someone who has been grievously and turned out to be fatally shot, and she was trying the best she could with her literally her fingers in the bullet holes to try to stop the bleeding. And it, she was brave, she was honorable, she was honest, and she was willing to hold anybody to account because one of the other amazing uh, results of her leadership was when she uh, chaired the Intelligence Committee and she was determined to do a study of what had happened uh, during the Iraq War, uh, during the War on Terrorism, uh, waterboarding, other kinds of abuses, uh, whether they had been directly or indirectly um, you know, ordered or had a blind eye turned uh, toward them. And, and she fought everybody about mm -hmm. that. She fought fellow senators. She fought the Obama administration. She fought everybody. And she came out with a you know, huge thousands of pages of report, later turned into a, a movie uh, starring Adam Driver. But she was undeterred because she believed so strongly that you had to face the truth about whether it was assault weapons yeah. or you know, behavior that uh, we weren't proud of. So she was a great colleague of mine. I'll, I'll tell you one final story. So after the, after the 08 primary, um, uh, then Senator uh, Obama called and asked if I would meet with him, uh, but could we go somewhere that wouldn't draw a lot of attention? I said, well, that's gonna be hard. Um, <laughs> but we thought, and I called Diane. I said, Diane, can Barack and I meet at your house? Um, and uh, she said, sure, of course you can. And you know, I had total trust in her. I literally got down in the back seat of the car leaving my house um, so that nobody would know I was coming. Uh, Obama put a press lid on, as you might remember, and told his press that he wasn't going anywhere. And then we spent, you know, a couple of hours uh, in her living room talking about, um, you know, the campaign, about, you know, what uh, 
um, I would do to support him, what you know, he saw as the challenges in the general election, the kind of conversation uh, that uh, led to you know, our working closely together, him asking me to be Secretary of State. And Diane left us alone, except every so often, popping in, asking us if we wanted more Chardonnay. Um, <laughs> so I will, I will miss her a lot. She was, uh, she was a very special person. So it was the Chardonnay Summit that led to you it being was. Secretary of State. <laughs> Chardonnay Summit. The Chardonnay yeah. Summit led to a pretty big job. Yeah. For you. Yeah. yeah exactly. the, uh, well, thank you for sharing that. Um, we wanted to talk today about uh, uh, something that you've written about for The Atlantic. And, and, and the interesting thing about this subject is, I mean, it's become a, a little bit of a truism mm -hmm. that um, politics is downstream from culture. And right. what we're learning more and more is that culture itself is downstream from technological disruption and psychiatry and theology and a whole bunch of other things. And, and, and so you wrote this piece for us recently. Um, the headline was The Weaponization of Loneliness. It's the name of this session, in fact. Um, and, and, and in it, you're, you're trying to explore um, what are the deeper causes of the polarization that we see and the sort of the general unhappiness that isn't always supported by a set of facts, right? right? Um, and, and I was wondering, maybe you could just walk, walk us through a little bit how you started thinking about loneliness, atomization, technology, all of these things, and how they, they, they lead to the dysfunction that we, we all feel we're experiencing. That's, that's a, a wonderful set of questions, Jeffrey, and, and really, um, for me, I started thinking about this uh, many years ago. Um, you know, there's been a lot of commentary uh, about what's happening to Americans, what's happening to our society, you know, long before Trump showed up, even before the internet and social media, where people um, were, you know, feeling dissatisfied, somewhat uh, unmoored, unsettled by the pace of change. Uh, little did we know how much faster it would move. Uh, and I, I wrote a book, you know, back in the 90s called It Takes a Village, which was a... Oh, that was of, you? Yeah, that was me. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, didn't, I didn't get briefed, sorry. Yeah, it, yeah. Well, I, I'll send you briefing Thank next you. time. Thank um, you. Yeah. Because I am coming back for the latte. Yeah, uh, you got it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I wrote that book in part because of what I saw um, politically primarily, but also culturally, where people um, were, you know, having challenges figuring out, you know, how do we raise our children? How do we form families? How do we um, combine work and family? A particular uh, issue for, for women like me. And, and so when I wrote that book, there was a lot of talk about, let's call it meaning in life, purpose in life, usefulness in life. Um, and, it was something that I spent a lot of time uh, pondering because there wasn't any easy answer to it. And then I began reading some people like Robert Putnam and Bowling Alone and others who were talking about the value of what they were calling social capital uh, in um, healthy societies that you know, really focused on quality of life uh, issues and where people were frankly you know, more satisfied with uh, uh, how they were uh, organized and living. So, you know, fast forward, we began to see the disruption, which initially was thrilling, you know, the technological disruption, the rise of social media. I mean, it was so exciting to be in connection with people anywhere in the world with literally, you know, a, a flick of a phone that your phone had the computing power of a mainframe computer, you know, 20 years before. I mean, there's just so much that was very um, thrilling about the world we could inhabit. And of course, a lot of the best uh, commentary about it was how it was going to bring us together, cross lines, bridge divisions. And that was, you know, something we, we saw and we were focused on. But then there was the dark underbelly and how technology was being manipulated and being used. You know, when um, you know, Barack Obama ran for president in 08, he really pioneered using technology to bring people together on behalf of his campaign. 
and it was very successful and it was held up as, uh, as a model. But by 2016, when I ran, um, the um, underbelly of the internet, we'd already seen in Gamergate, uh, the kind of uprising, a, you know, misogynistic, racist uprising uh, against, uh, you know, women or outsiders of any kind, talking about, you know, the, you know, the way that people who gamed all the time were behaving and how that unfortunately spilled into the so-called real world. So we were beginning to see some indicators and running through this was psychological operations, which really formed the basis for a lot of the technical uh, developments in propaganda and active measures, you know, not just by the Russians, Cambridge Analytica, others. So we were watching in real time the kind of changing of the impact of technology in ways that I certainly had not foreseen, did not understand. Um, and then we began to get evidence from scientists, uh, you know, medical doctors, uh, particularly pediatricians, but also psychiatrists, psychologists, and others, that they were beginning to see very um, clear impact from uh, screen time, but not just screen time, what people were doing on those screens. Mm -hmm. And the American Academy of Pediatrics came out some years ago, um, which got very little attention, but came out and said, based on what we're seeing, no child under two should have access to a screen. They have since revised that to a higher and higher age because we are learning how screens, how technology, how the addiction to technology literally changes the way your brain develops. So there was a beginning um, of a commentary sounding the alarm about all of this, and then we began to get evidence about increases in anxiety, depression, eating disorders, particularly among young women, but also you know young men as well. And then COVID hit, and COVID was a mass exercise in loneliness and dislocation. Uh, and so then we come out of COVID with a long trail of consequences that we are frankly, in my view, still working through. And then uh, the Surgeon General, Vivek uh, Murthy, put out a very thoughtful report talking about how loneliness is a both physical and mental health risk. We now have evidence that loneliness exacerbates uh, conditions of poor health often precipitates uh, those conditions. Uh, outcomes are worse. Uh, we're seeing evidence of how being involved in the outer world, having friendship networks, being involved in uh, volunteer activities, associations, sports teams, whatever uh, brings you together with other people is actually a net positive for your health. So the evidence is pushing us toward recognizing something kind of old fashioned that we need to figure out how to bring people back into personal contact at the very time when the addiction to social media and the screens is driving people more and more down rabbit holes and uh, often alone. And, and one, I, I talked to uh, the Surgeon General after the report came out and he said he was particularly concerned about young women. And uh, I said, so why, what's the difference between young women and, and young men? He said, I don't, you know, we don't know for sure, but our speculation, our hypothesis is that young men who spend a lot of time in front of screens are more likely than not doing something, like playing a game, learning how to code, coming up with some kind of activity that keeps them engaged and often with other people, especially if you're gaming. Whereas young women are often alone, scrolling, seeing things that make them feel bad about themselves, finding out they were left out, being pressured to engage in activities like sending pictures of themselves that are really fraught with all kinds of uh, dangers uh, and risks. 
So I thought that was a, a really interesting insight because if you can actually form a real community online, maybe you can avoid some of these consequences, but too often people are not doing that. They are now in a very insular, lonely place. And so, you know, and, and the last thing I would say yeah. is in the article I talk about how Steve Bannon, who is in the gaming industry. Well, this is what I wanted to go to is, is yeah. surpri surprisingly, I wanted to go to Steve Bannon. <clears throat> well, better you than me is all yeah, I can yeah. say. <clears throat> I didn't make you write it. <laughs> no. But I did put that in the article because Bannon was in gaming originally. And, and that was well, he had an insight. He had right. an insight, but he was actually in the industry for a while. Right. And his insight was that all these young men were seeking something. They were engaged. They were in, you know, incredibly devoted to their gaming uh, and that they could be... Uh, weaponized, they could be used um, because oftentimes their emotions were so raw. I mean, yelling and screaming at their screen, yelling and screaming with, you know, the guys they're with. But it, and, and instead of being on a, a playing field doing that, they're in, you know, whatever room they're in, and they can be reached individually, not just collectively. And he had the insight that you could take that energy and, frankly, some of that negative uh, reaction that uh, gaming produced and weaponize it for political purposes. The roll back just, just for, for one minute to the, 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 the founding techno optimists of social media and of, and of the screens. <clears throat> do, do you think that so, so Mark Zuckerberg, for instance, had a belief, I'm, I'm going to credit him with being a, this being a sincere belief, that instant, instant global connectivity to everyone else in the world was a good thing rather than a bad thing. Mm -hmm. My question to you is, well, A, were, was that just marketing ultimately, or did, did they genuinely believe that this would be a good thing? Um, and B, is there a good internet? that you can imagine? Is there a good social media ecosystem or does it always kind of devolve into lowest common denominator nastiness? Well, I, I, I will give the benefit of the doubt uh, to the, the early founders, as you say, the techno optimists. I do think they believe that. Then though, they had to figure out how to pay for what they wanted to do. So if you, if you could have a free internet with no pressure to maximize negativity because fear and hate and anger drive more interactions, uh, people are more likely to remember it if it was negative, and then you can place ads against it, but first you've got to make that connection. I, I think if there had been a couple of things. Maybe, you know, when uh, the Communications Act in the 1990s was passed, the idea was very optimistic that there would be this open internet that would be available to people. It could provide these connections. And so it was viewed as a pass-through and it was not viewed as having any um, responsibility for gatekeeping like you do at the Atlantic. You know, you have to you actually fact checks. I it ch fact check people. I know that because I've uh, written uh, pieces for you, and you, you know, have standards that you try to apply. But the idea originally behind um, the uh, internet and then the development of the social media uh, platforms was that they were like, you know, just pass-throughs, and so they shouldn't be held responsible. Things would just flow right. through. And that was an economic decision. Well, it 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 was a. It was partly an economic decision, but it was also out of this techno-optimist perspective. Like, you know, uh, they're not a publisher. They're more like a utility. You know, people push their electrons down. We don't know exactly where the electrons are going to end up. Is it for a nuclear power plant or to turn on your toaster? But we're going to allow them to have that uh, lack of uh, accountability, no liability 
for what was published. But, but they control the algorithm. They control everything. And right, and, and the <laughs> algorithms accentuate the negative. That's right. So that's, a, that's not a utility. But I don't think people, I don't think certainly most people, probably the tech leaders themselves understood that. Right. But I don't think policymakers, the public, the press, I don't think most people understood that in the late 90s, early aughts, that the algorithms would in effect be determining what you watched and therefore what ads you would be subjected to. I think, you know, once it turned into an ad driven rather than subscription, it could have been subscription, um, but that was not the choice made. And now we are at the brink of yet even more manipulation through artificial intelligence and, and uh, you know, uh, generative uh, artificial intelligence. So I think that they're, everybody's doubling down. Now they, they come to Washington and they say, oh, please, please stop us from doing anything bad. You know, <laughs> govern us, put guardrails up, and then they go back to urging their engineers to come up with even more ways to get more people to spend more time through their algorithms uh, on the sites. And I think the loneliness piece of this is that rather than the dream of interconnectivity, it has caused disruption, divisiveness, and even destruction because of the manipulation, not only by the tech companies themselves, but increasingly by leaders who use it. You know, I, I mentioned to you that uh, Maria Ressa, the Nobel uh, Peace Prize winner, the great journalist from the Philippines, is um, visiting us at Columbia, where I'm, I'm now teaching a foreign policy decision-making course. And she was one of the first people who understood how leaders were beginning to manipulate uh, the algorithms. Because, I mean, if you pour enough content you know, into a site, the algorithms pick it up. They see, oh, people are looking at that. Let's get more of it. How, mu how much faster can we get it? And so if you're in Myanmar and you're in the military in Myanmar and you want to uh, drive the Rohingya people out, you began using social media. If you're in the Philippines, where 97% of people in the Philippines used Facebook, that was their major news source, but also their major you know, ability to connect, then you get a dictator like Duarte and others who use that. So this is now a, um, a serious threat uh, to, you know, in international relations, to national stability, uh, to the kind of impact on individuals that we were talking about earlier. And we seem incapable of really coming together to do something about it. You stay on this tech business issue for a second, because a lot of people would say, especially in, in that side of the, the coin, you know, populism, nastiness, mm -hmm. misinformation mm -hmm. existed before mm -hmm. Facebook and the internet. I mean, obviously there have been populist movements throughout American history. Uh, there's a counter argument that says that Trumpism could not possibly exist without the algorithmic help of these companies. How do you fall on this question of of, of the role of uh, the role of technology, these technologies in the rise of populism and Trumpism. Well, you're right. Uh, human nature being what it is, it's existed for a very long time, but never with the amplification and the uh, acceleration of lies and misinformation and disinformation that we have today. This is so much more sophisticated by a you know factor of you know. I, I, so so high I can't imagine. Um, so I don't think we can say tech changed human nature, but tech went right to- Uncovered human nature? Well, played to that part of human nature that is most subject to fear and anger and hate um, because it was good business. I mean, a lot of these guys, don't have a political agenda, or if they have a political agenda, they will, will say, oh yeah, you know, we, we want, you know, more people to have better lives, and you know, they have a, a kind of uh, optimistic, uh, left-leaning sort of uh, analysis, but their activities are driving more and more people uh, into acting on their fears, acting on disinformation, than was ever possible before. 
You know, Rwanda led to a genocidal massacre because of radio. The Balkan War, setting uh, you know, Serbs and Croats against Bosniak Muslims, was fed by the radio. And look at the damage it did. Um, but now we can set people against one another so much more easily and with very little accountability. And I think that is uh, very much the challenge that we face in trying to figure out how, if we can, put at least part of the genie back in the bottle. And the only group in the world that's done that is the European Union with their attempt to regulate uh, technology. But, but European Union countries uh, have, um, culturally, have a different understanding of censorship and free speech than, than we do. So the question is, when does putting the genie back in the bottle cross over a line into censorship? <clears throat> you know, there's, there's never been protection for certain forms of speech. You know that because you've been a journalist for so long. I know that because I'm a recovering lawyer and I remember, you know, <laughs> <clears throat> some of those cases. Um, so it's a, uh, a false uh, charge that trying to regulate harmful, damaging speech is a violation of free speech. Because remember, you know, the companies themselves can do whatever they want to do to regulate speech. You know, you could have a site which says, you know, I, I, I for one am never gonna let the, you know, the algorithm is gonna kick out the name Trump. It's never gonna appear. That's a business decision. That's their, that's their right to do that. Not that they would. Um, they make decisions about pornography. They're getting further and further behind and trying to prevent children from accessing that, but they try. But when you've got bad actors saying that the government cannot try to correct false information about things like vaccines because that would, quote, violate free speech, that's a total misunderstanding of the whole canon of free speech law. So do you have to be careful? Of course you have to be careful, but that doesn't mean it can't be done. And one of the arguments that I have made for quite some time is that there's that section in that 1990s law, uh, it's called Section 230, which grants the uh, technology companies basically freedom from liability no matter what shows up. Uh, and that should be repealed. They should have certain obligations about what appears on their site. So we're in a, we're in a situation now, we're a little more than a year out from the next most consequential election in history, but this time that might be the most consequential election in American history, and it might, God forbid, be the last American election in, in, in American history if we're not careful. Um, but, and, and you know, because you've studied his thinking, uh, Steve Bannon has a, 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 an idea that's related to what you're talking about, which is the flood the zone with shit. Right. Uh, that's you know, right. And, and this, this, this is directly learned from authoritarians. If you provide so much false information and to put it into the ecosystem. Nobody will ever know what's real and what, I mean, you say AI right. can generate even more now. Um, so the, 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 the question for you is how do you re relate all of this to the coming electoral challenge? Right. Uh, it's nothing surprising anymore, but it's still somewhat shocking that Donald, and I've been speaking plainly about this, so there's no, and I think we have to speak plainly about this. You know, uh, Donald Trump is a race, this is not a partisan observation, it's a reality observation. He's a racist and a misogynist, and he's facing 91 felony counts in multiple different cases. Um, and he tried to overthrow the government, and he incited the sacking of the Capitol. Um, and, and I have asked this question yesterday to a couple of different people on this stage. I'll ask you. It's, it's why is he still <laughs> a player in American politics? Is, is, that, is that directly related to this degraded information ecosystem that we have? And, and all, of the, all of the other ideas that you're talking about, the loneliness issues and the atomization mm -hmm. issues, mm -hmm. how do you tie this all together looking at the coming challenge from your party's perspective? Well, I think you're right to raise it the way you did because um, 
the strategy is to flood the zone. It is a tried and true strategy. Uh, the Russians have been very good at it for a very long time through what they call active measures, but it's the fire hose of lies. You literally spray so many lies into uh, the you know, social, political atmosphere, people don't know what to believe. And they then fall back on uh, whatever information they get, and because so much information people are now getting comes from uh, the social media uh, that they consume, which is filled with uh, conspiracy theories and you know really crazy stuff, but which is viewed in a in a very open way by people who just are trying to understand the world in which they find themselves. You know, I I don't know what to believe, so I'm going to go look on the internet. I cannot tell you how many times people said to me something that I knew was totally false. I said, you know, that's not true, and their response would be, but I saw it on the internet. <laughs> so the internet has a position of credibility. So if you are a manipulator, you're, you're holding that big fire hose, you know how to manipulate. And remember, you know, in 2016, uh, the Trump campaign, the Russians, Cambridge Analytica, the whole cabal had about 5,000 data points on 136 million Americans. And if you are good at this, which they all are, they know how to get to you. It's not like you can say, oh, well, nobody's ever going to convince me of anything. You are vulnerable because they have a profile of you as to what you will believe, what you'll watch, what you'll listen to, what you'll buy. And we have voluntarily given that information over. We've not been compensated for it. They have used it to sell more products against our own you know, identity. And so if you think about what's about to happen coming in the next year, and I would not um, at all underestimate what the Trump campaign, Bannon, and their crew has uh, in mind, I would not at all discount Putin playing a role again. Um, but I also think that others, like the Chinese, are much more sophisticated than they were you know, four years or certainly seven years ago. It's going to be a storm of influence operations trying to get into your psyche. And you know, there have been experiments run. So one experiment that um, really made an impression on me was you know, uh, women who wanted to know how to make organic baby food, you know, pretty innocent and laudable goal, would go on looking for recipes for organic baby food, benefits of organic baby food, and within minutes were directed to an anti-vaccine site, directed to, in, you know, when this all started, with affinity groups back in 2016. Of course, I didn't know any of this was happening because I was not that sophisticated. They would be directed to a Trump affinity group, you know, young mothers for Trump. And they would all be talking about how Donald Trump will make sure there are no bad things, no contaminants in the food you want to feed your baby. I mean, he, that never crossed his mind in you know, <laughs> his entire life. Um, but it was, it was very well constructed and very uh, well delivered. And, and you know, researchers watched how all this happened. So imagine how much more sophisticated the manipulators are this time around. And I want to just add this artificial intelligence piece because deep fakes are reality. They've gotten more sophisticated. You know, in 2018, you remember that deep fake about Nancy Pelosi where they made her look like she was drunk? And her office immediately said, that, you know, that's fake. You know, first of all, they took this clip and that clip and they added that. It was totally fake. And YouTube took it down, Twitter took it down back then, and Facebook would not take it down. And, um, you know, we, I was one of the people reaching out to Facebook and saying, you know, it's fake. It doesn't exist. They said, oh, we think, we think our uh, customers can figure that out. Well, that's why I was asking you 
about whether it's cynical or naive. It is now. Now it's, I think it started naive. Started naive. I went. think it started naive, but it didn't take long to get cynical because the amount of money involved is beyond your wildest imagination, right? And so we see that happening, and we've been kind of like hapless and helpless about it, and now we're moving into uh, the era where AI will be at work. So if you see, I mean... And AI has the capacity to flood, fl to, double, triple flood. Well, no, yeah, not only... Can make more. Not only triple flood, but be really sophisticated about what they're flooding, and... Um, in you know, I've talked to a number of the people who are <clears throat> on the front lines of that, and they sound just like the tech guys from the very beginning back in the day. This will be such a great, liberating technology. <laughs> Human beings will be able to, you know, think and do so much more. You know, and there's truth to that. I mean, it's, you know, there's just like back in the day. It's thrilling. It's exciting. It's a new frontier. But... The dangers and the risks are both obvious and not yet known. And I, I, will t I heard, a, I heard a, a presentation by one of the leading AI uh, uh, pioneers, and here's what he said. He said, you know, this is a new science. Old science, physics, chemistry, biology, studied what was there and tried to understand it. We are inventing something new, and we will have to study it as we go. I went, whoa, that's comforting. Yeah. So, you know, every, there is no absolute perfect technology. Every time you make an advance in technology, somebody can figure out, you know, how to manipulate it, how to come up with a negative use for it. But shame on us if we don't grasp the request, whether it was sincere or not, by everybody who came to Capitol Hill just a few weeks ago, met with Schumer. They were all in the room. And I talked to some of the people who are not the tech company people, but others from civil rights groups and from you know, health groups and others who have a big stake in what happens with the algorithms, what happens with you know, the further development of AI. And they all were saying, yeah, yeah, we know, we know, we need some kind of restraints, guard, guardrails, please, please, you know, stop us before we hurt somebody. <laughs> well, <laughs> we, why aren't we doing it? And, right. and you're right, I mean, at least the EU, yes, they don't have the same definition of free speech, but they have the same political challenges. Look at what, um, you know, Facebook has done on several cases. They have blocked information. You know, the Chinese government says we don't want people to know about dissident acts or Uyghurs and, you know, concentration camps. And if you carry any of that, you know, we may kick you out. Well, it's so funny when their profit model is uh, under attack, they figure out a way to stop information at the request of governments. So talk about free speech. That's exactly what they're doing uh, by, you know, giving up, you know, their control in response to government uh, pressure, mm. or, or what's happening in Canada with the announcement about the connection with the assassination of a Sikh leader and all of that. Well, you know, India is basically saying to Facebook, you'd better not report that. And Facebook says, okay. But when we say, don't report false election information, don't run deep fakes, they say free speech. <laughs> and we do have more restraints, but it's not absolute, and they know it's not absolute, and the lawyers they employ know it's not absolute, and it's really imperative that the Congress, and I know how dysfunctional it is, you don't have to tell me that, I understand it, <laughs> but that the Congress take action, and, and Schumer had both Republicans and Democrats in the room, so maybe there's some hope there. Um, I know we're over time, but this is important stuff that you're talking about. I want to ask you two final questions, they're quick questions, but they're big. They relate to schools and, and children. The first is, you mentioned the pandemic. In retrospect, was it a mistake to keep the schools closed the way we kept the schools closed? And the second yeah. question, I'll give you yeah, both. Yeah. The second question is, I'm asking you as someone who studied this, but also as a mother and, and more specifically as a grandmother. Phones and children, phones and schools, what would you do if you could make a universal policy about that? 
Well, I am very much against um, phones in school. I'm very much against, I mean, not put it in your locker. That's fine. I mean, I, I get that. You have to call your mom to pick you up. You have to get a ride to your after school activity. I get that. But I think that no phones in the classroom, no phones in other activities. You know, we've got to start relating to each other again as, as human beings with all of our, you know, pluses and minuses. And as I told you, I'm, gonna, I'm going from here to Arkansas. I, I'm doing an interview with Robert Putnam, you know, bowling alone. And he was ahead of this before most of us and understood what happens when you degrade social capital. Well, you can't have social capital if people aren't talking to each other. And frankly, you know, it's very sad to me when you see little kids, I'm talking toddlers and, and, and you know, four and five year olds, they can't get the attention of the adults in their lives. They're, whether they're in their home, whether they're in a playground, I mean, it is, you know, we now know, that's another thing we have evidence of, screens cannot raise and educate your child. You have to have interpersonal uh, connection. You know, it doesn't have to be a mother and a father. It can be a sibling. It can be an aunt and uncle. It can be, you know, an older, you know, older neighbor, friend. But somebody has to be connecting. That's what triggers the brain. The study that I just read about showed that screens don't trigger the brain development the way that reading does, the way that talking, singing, being with adults do. So for me, I don't think you, kids should have their own phones until they're, I know you're going to kill me, but <laughs> until they're in high school and I would say. Until they're 75 years yeah, old. Well, <laughs> well, no, that's the other funny thing is you know who's most influenced electorally by their phones <laughs> are people over 65. I mean, <laughs> over half of them voted for Trump because of what they watch on the screen and what they watch on their television. So. So the, the, the child, I think we should be guided by um, what we are now learning about the impact on kids and be, as, you know, be as, as strict as you can be, but try to get support from other parents because you know what it's like. Everybody else has it. Why can't I have it? On the school thing, I think in retrospect, that is a very uh, uh, fair point to make. Because, but at the time, it was terrifying for people. It was terrifying for teachers, terrifying for parents. But I went back and looked at pictures from the so-called Spanish flu era in New York City. Kids were in their classrooms, in their coats, their hats, their mittens, with the windows wide open. So they were in school, but they were actually circulating the air, which we didn't. A lot of our schools no longer have very good air circulating mechanisms. So I think it, it, it should have been much more dependent upon the school, the place, the rate of infection, hospitalization, death, and all of that. But I think we, we did, to some extent, overdo it. And I do think that children bore the brunt of it because they lost a lot of learning. We know that now. Um, you know, my, my daughter and son-in-law and, and um, their three kids lived with us during, uh, during COVID. And, you know, in where we were living, uh, north of New York City, um, my granddaughter actually went to school, but they would test all the time. And if there was an outbreak, they would stop going to school for like 10 days. Then they would go back to school. It was disruptive, but it was still a place where she knew she was supposed to be. My grandson, the older one, who was then four, went to a preschool. He wore a mask. He was happy to be with other kids, because he, but he had to wear a mask. The teachers wore a mask. And wherever they could, they had windows open. They were outdoors. So, you know, we looked for experiences that would keep, you know, keep them uh, engaged uh, with, with other kids. And my, you know, little one who came out at seven months, you know, until he, until like he was two, he never saw another kid besides his brother and sister. Mm. You know, he was pretty unsocialized. Um, so, <laughs> we're, we're still working on that. Um, <laughs> But, but it, is, it, it, is, it is a lot of lessons. I just, don't, I just hope we don't learn the wrong lessons. We're very, unfortunately, prone these days to learning the wrong lessons. You know, we're going to have a vaccine out, whether there's an uptake or not. You know, older people, immunocompromised people, you know, people 
in my view, should get vaccinated. I will get vaccinated when, when it's uh, available. And, <clears throat> you know, so, so will my husband. And we're going to get our flu vaccine <clears throat> next week. And, you know, so I, I think we've got to learn the right lessons. And I think there are a lot of lessons. If we can cut through the hysteria on all sides about the schools, let's try to learn the right lessons. Mm. Um, well, uh, we'll have you back next year. Are you punching my uh, card? You'll get your coffee card tonight, <laughs> and it'll be about five or six weeks before the election, so we'll have nothing to talk about. And um, well, we'll I, see. I, I just, I just want to underscore what you said, Jeffrey, because it, it it's, har it's hard to believe we're at this point. But basically, I used to travel around the world as Secretary of State talking about elections, talking about the peaceful transition of power, talking about dictators or authoritarian people who got themselves elected, like, you know, Viktor Orban, and then it was one and done. I got elected, let's go after the press, let's go after the political opposition, let's go after academic institutions, any kernel of opposition. And you're 100% right to tell people that uh, if this doesn't turn out right, this could very well be our last election. And on that note, enjoy lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll see, we'll see you next year. We'll see you next year. <laughs>